Good evening, everyone. All good talks should start with a quote from a wise man. <laughs> Kids are different today, I hear every mother say. Mother needs something to calm her down. And although she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill. She goes running for the shelter of mother's little helper, and they help her on her way, help her through her busy day. So Mick Jagger wrote this song in 1965 to describe the tedium of the, American, of the life of the American housewife. And mother's little helper refers to Valium or diazepam. And it was thought at a certain time that it would provide better living through chemistry. So what are the benzodiazepines? What are their benefits and risks? Why do we need them? What are they used for? And what are the concerns about their use in Ireland today? And how could a medication be simultaneously described as one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, or as being responsible for more pain, unhappiness, and damage than anything else in our society. Perhaps a look back in history might tell us why we've come to be where we are now and inform what we need to do in the future. So what did we do before we had tranquilizers? Well, alcohol has been used for thousands of years, and it's been used medicinally as a sedative and to alleviate anxiety. The Bible talks of wine to gladden the heart of man. In the 19th century, a range of potions and nostrums were developed, and they were often laced with cannabis and opiates and alcohol. Um, most of the public didn't actually know that because they weren't listed on the label. Americanitis, which sounds like a terrible affliction, <laughs> could be cured with chloral hydrate. Peraldehyde and bromides were used, but these substances were all very toxic and they were addictive. Now in America, at the beginning of the 20th century, psychoanalysis was the way to cure the neurosis. But the problem was, that it was very time consuming and very expensive. And it often required you to go five times a week for a year or even longer. In the asylum, the tranquilizing chair was considered a humane way to pacify disruptive patients. So you see, at the beginning of the 20th century, when the pharmaceutical age began, there was a receptive environment for medications that were gentler and better ways of relieving suffering. So barbituric acid was discovered in 1865 by Adolf von Bayer. But a medicinal product wasn't found until 1903, when two scientists working for Bayer discovered that barbiturates could put dogs to sleep. It was then developed into a medicinal product and marketed under the name Veronal. Barbiturates provided a reliable and instant way to relieve anxiety. Production mushroomed during World War II when barbiturates were used to help the war wounded and to treat the casualties and the civilians um, during that time. Barbiturates were marketed and were used as, a, as a, an easy way to transcend anxiety, but they had problems. They stupefied as they sedated. Users acted drunk, and they, uh, were, they were addictive because they caused an immediate high. And they were very dangerous in overdose. In fact, it didn't take that high a dose to cause very drastic consequences, and it was entirely possible to overdose accidentally. 
there were many casualties. So you see, there was a place and a, a need there for a medication that was safer. And the, the story of the tranquilizers begins with a product called meprobamate. And this is a medication that few of us have actually heard of today. So Alexander Fleming had discovered penicillin in 1928, but there was a problem. They needed to be able to mass produce it, and they needed a preservative. It was while working on a penicillin preservative that Frank Berger discovered a compound that could calm and sedate. He was fascinated. What is the physiological basis of overexcitability? Unfortunately, the company he later worked for, called Carter Pharmaceuticals, they didn't think there was a market for anxiety medication in an era when Freudian psychoanalysis was the, ray, the way to treat neurosis. They were better known for making laxatives. So they stalled the product, although they did do a bit of market research. And they asked 200 doctors if they would be willing to prescribe a medication for everyday anxiety. They said no. Eventually, Frank Berger, he, he persisted. And the medication was launched on the market in 1955 to little fanfare. It was named Milltown after a tranquil little town in New Jersey. Sales rocketed. Milltown became the very first blockbuster drug. It was marketed as a reliable um, relief from everything from the problem child to the senile patient. But really, it was pla its place in popular culture that fueled its use. They were given catchy names like happy pills, peace pills, emotional aspirin, don't give a damn pills. This is Schwab's pharmacy on Hollywood Boulevard, the pharmacy for the stars. Celebrities openly discussed their love of and their reliance on Milton. Lucille Ball's assistant kept a stock of it on the set of I Love Lucy. Comedians and chat show hosts like Milton Berle openly discussed Milton. Aldous Huxley gave Meprobamate a glowing review. Tennessee Williams added it to the list of medications to which he was already addicted. Salvador Dali created an entire exhibition for the 1957 American Medical Association Conference. He entitled it, Chris Alida, The Liberation from Anxiety Through Meprobamate. Using medications for everyday anxiety became part of everyday life. Pharmacies couldn't keep enough of it on the shelf. So I suppose without Milltown, there may not have been an environment where there was a, a race or a, a need for a tranquilizing medication. The story of the benzodiazepines begins in Basel in Switzerland in 1940. It was here that Dr. Leo Sternbach came to work. Now, Dr. Sternbach was Jewish. Anti-Semitism was spreading. Roche Pharmaceuticals were the only Swiss company of the time not to Aryanize their workforce. They recognized that Dr. Sternbach's safety was in danger, so they relocated him and his wife to their facility in New Jersey. He escaped the Holocaust. It was here that he was told to create a new tranquilizer. But after a year of trying, he hadn't really come up with anything. So they told him, OK, now, we're going we're gonna to create a new antibiotic instead. This didn't go so well either. So in the midst of the disarray of his laboratory, Dr. Sternbach and his assistant decided to do a clear out and to regroup. And they came across the last 
chemical that they had, they had synthesized in their look for tranquilizers, RO50690. It could easily have ended up in the bin, but they tested it. And what Dur Dr. Sternbach had created was a completely new chemical class of tranquilizer called the benzodiazepines. The first benzodiazepine was chlordiazepoxide. They gave it the brand name Lib Librium from the word equilibrium, a medication that would restore balance and calm. It was followed in 1963 by diazepam or Valium. And diazepam was more potent than Librium and it didn't have the bitter aftertaste that some people got when taking its predecessor. Valium went on to become one of the widest selling medications in the Western world. And so the family of benzodiazepines grew. Over 1,000 benzodiazepines have been synthesized. We have diazepam, clonazepam, nitrazepam, fluorazepam, prazepam. There's certainly plenty of choice there. I've included the Z-hypnotics because even though technically they're not benzodiazepines because they have a different chemical structure, they do work in the same way and they have the same effect. <coughs> so they differ. The difference between these medications is in how long they act within your body and how quickly they begin to work. So depending on what difficulties the patient presents with, you might receive, be offered one for um, sleep, or one for anxiety, or one to help prevent seizures, or to, pre, to be a muscle relaxant, or as a pre-medication before surgery. So in terms of anxiety then, when might someone be prescribed a benzodiazepine? Well, benzodiazepines are used for people for whom Anxiety really makes it very, very difficult for them to negotiate life. Every day they are faced with a series of obstacles. They, they cannot see their way past it. They are mountains to climb. This person never feels safe. They yearn for sleep because it's only when they sleep that they don't feel anxious, but that sleep never comes. Anxiety is the tightening of your chest, the snowballing worries that feel they might, that they might become an avalanche and just bury you in an instant. So what does it feel like then to take a benzodiazepine? Well, benzodiazepines make people feel calmer and more relaxed. And they work very quickly to relieve distress. Some people feel very sedated when they take them. They can impair concentration and reaction times, make people a little unsteady. And some people might get memory problems. But despite the list of side effects, benzodiazepines seem to be very well tolerated by people. And very few people stop them because of side effects. They're relatively safe medications for short-term use. Now, it wasn't until 1977 that we actually discovered how benzodiazepines worked from the work of a man called Hans Mahler, who worked at Roche Pharmaceuticals. So in our brains, we have neurotransmitters that help brain cells send signals from one to another. And this is how we function every day. The neurotransmitter called GABA is the brain's natural calmer. It's what the brain uses every day to reduce brain activity. And this natural calmer is enhanced by benzodiazepines. Dr. Sternbach made Roche Pharmaceuticals one of the giants of the pharmaceutical industry. But he himself was not a wealthy man. His joy in life came from his work as a chemist 
and he said that it gave him comfort to know that his work helped people to feel better. So why are these medicines so popular? Well, they are replacing the barbiturates and meprobamate. So they're less addictive and they're safer in overdose. And it seemed at the time that they might actually be the pill for every ill. And people, they needed relief from genuine suffering. But it was also an age of consumerism. People welcomed tranquilizers in the same way as washing machines and electric fridges and TV dinners or cosmetics. And it was a golden age of advertising. Don Draper from Mad, from Mad Men says that, happy, that advertising is based on one thing, happiness. And he describes happiness as freedom from fear. Anti-anxiety medications were ideal consumer products. They were marketed for everything, from the psychological to the physical illness. It was aimed to have as broad a base as possible for these medications. And although the advertisements were aimed at doctors, <coughs> at prescribers, they leaked into popular media. Benzodiazepines would help the lonely and bored and unsatisfied housewife to escape her reality. Notice that, ben, that you know, there was nothing you could do to change her situation. You can't set her free, but you can make her put up with it without complaining. They could be used for the 35-year-old single woman who had not yet found a man to marry who would live up to her own father. For the menopausal woman, the menopausal teacher, whose fluctuations in mood made it very difficult for her to react to life, to life's stresses in a calm uh, manner. Benzodiazepines allowed people to function socially they were the antidote for being female. But in the early days, it was actually men who featured most prominently in these advertisements. Now, men's anxieties were characterized differently. So in a Roche manual called Aspects of Anxiety, men's um, Men's need was to live up to society's expectation of ideal masculinity. Whatever occurs, a man must be stronger and better controlled than a woman would be. <coughs> Men of the 1960s suffered in silence. For that reason, men's anxieties were characterized as debilitating physical symptoms like chest pain or stomach ulcers or high blood pressure. Men, they weren't prone to emotional outbursts. Anxiety was the cost that they paid for their success. Or it was the cost that they paid for being surrounded by battle axes. Sales of Valium mushroomed. They grew. It was huge. And they reached their peak in the mid-70s. In 1978, there were 2.3 billion tablets sold in America. But by the 1980s, the story had changed. And benzodiazepines became viewed as dangerous medications, recklessly prescribed and carelessly taken without regard for the consequences. So we've known since 1961 that benzodiazepines could cause withdrawal effects when they are abruptly discontinued. And these withdrawal effects are often like the anxiety that they were used to treat in the first place, things like nervousness or difficulty sleeping. 
Now, most people who experience withdrawal effects have mild symptoms that last maybe a few days or at most a few weeks. But it is true that for some people, these withdrawal effects can be very upsetting. Now, withdrawal symptoms affect about four out of every 10 people who take the medication continuously, even for as short a period as a month or so. And they happen when the medication is abruptly discontinued. Now, this is a physical or physiological dependence. And people who have been taking their medication as prescribed can experience that. And we don't know who will experience withdrawal symptoms and who won't. So in order to avoid them, the medication should be discontinued slowly. Now, at that time in America, stories of benzodiazepine abuse began to surface. Betty Ford, the former American first lady, checked herself into a rehabilitation clinic in 1978. She said that she'd begun to over-medicate herself. She said it was an insidious thing, and I mean to rid myself of its damning effects. She went on to found the famous Betty Ford Center in California. Barbara Gordon was an award-winning television presenter and writer. Her memoir, I'm Dancing as Fast as I Can, described what happened when you abruptly discontinued Valium. It was a bestseller in 1979. There was a panic growing in America. There were three congressional hearings about the use of tranquilizers, one of which was chaired by Edward Kennedy. But it seems that one of the things that drove the vilification of Valium was a second wave of feminism in the late 70s. It was a reaction to the old adage that anatomy was destiny. Why should women put up with unsatisfactory situations and just emotionally readjust? It was a reaction to the fact that medical system was dominated by men and male stereotypes. Women hadn't been given the right information about Valium or the oral contraceptive pill, for that matter. It was these campaigns that led to the, to the law that patient information leaflets need to, be, need to accompany every medication. Valium became a symbol of sexism. Stories, sensationalized stories of drug abuse appeared in popular women's magazines like Cosmopolitan or Good Housekeeping. Drug addicts were no longer hippies or disgruntled war veterans or the marginalized in society. They could be anyone. She could even be you. <coughs> so what is addiction? Well, in addition to the physical dependence, that means that when you discontinue a medication suddenly, you get physical reaction to that. Tolerance also develops. So you need more and more of a medication or a substance in order to achieve the same effect. Now, this tolerance doesn't seem to happen for people who take their medication long term for an anxiety disorder. You crave the substance. So it becomes an all-encompassing preoccupation. There is uncontrollable drug-seeking behavior. And this is done without regard to adverse health consequences or the impact on yourself or on your family. And addiction is a serious consequence of benzodiazepine use. Now, the answer to this was thought to be restriction and legislation. So for example, in New York in 1989, stricter rules around the prescribing of benzodiazepines were put in place. So now you could only get a one month supply of the medication and you had to go back to the doctor for follow up. And you would only get a further prescription if there were compelling circumstances. <coughs> Permissive prescribers 
would be found because there was a centralized register of benzodiazepine prescriptions. Illegal possession or sale became a felony. One man got four years in prison for possession of nine Valium tablets that he got from his friend. So the restrictions worked and there was a 44% decrease in benzodiazepine prescribing. But there was also unintended consequences. The illegal drug market flourished. There was a disproportionate effect on low income families because if you were on Medicaid, which would be their equivalent of our medical card system, then there was only a certain number of GP consultations that you could have each year. Worryingly, barbiturate prescribing increased. Meanwhile, in the UK, Esther Ranson did a programme detailing the plight of three people who were trying to stop benzodiazepines. Thousands of people called the BBC afterwards sharing similar stories. It seems that in America, or in the United Kingdom, there was a problem with people who had been prescribed the medication with escalating doses, and now they were having great difficulty in stopping it. They referred to themselves as involuntary addicts. They hadn't received proper information about the medication they had been prescribed. The Beat the Benzos campaign began in 2000, and it has been a very active lobby in the United Kingdom. In 2002, Professor Heather Ashton published her book on benzodiazepines, on how to withdraw from them safely. And she has found great success with her methods. So it's very possible to stop these medications if that's what you want to do. The benzodiazepines were no longer acceptable for the everyday anxieties of the 1960s. The, po the modern solution became a postmodern problem. So how do doctors differentiate between what might be everyday anxiety and what is an anxiety disorder? So we all know what it's like to have anxiety. Anxiety is part of the normal human experience. Avard Monk said that without anxiety, he would have been like a ship without a rudder. We need anxiety to decide whether to face a danger or whether to flee. But as anxiety increases, it reaches a peak, a peak for our best performance. But once it goes further, once it gets too much, our performance and our ability to function decreases. We burn out. Now, the symptoms of anxiety can be physical, like dry mouth and palpitations or nausea, or they can be psychological, like nervous, nervousness or racing thoughts or preoccupation. And they affect the way we behave. We avoid things that we would normally do. So anxiety disorders, there are a number of different types. So if you imagine the last time that you were really, really anxious, maybe you had to go into an interview or a meeting or sit an exam, that knot in your stomach, the sweaty palms, the heart racing, that sense of dread. And imagine what it would be like to feel like that all of the time, like someone with a generalized anxiety disorder. A person with social anxiety disorder would find it very, very difficult to come to an event like this tonight. Someone with agoraphobia wouldn't even leave the house for fear of having a panic attack. And during that panic attack, they actually think that they are going to die. Anxiety disorders differ from normal anxiety 
in that the symptoms are more severe. They last longer and they interfere with the person's work, activities and relationships. It's estimated that around 20% of us will experience an anxiety disorder in our lifetime. And women are about twice as likely to experience this as men. And anxiety disorders can be very debilitating. You're constantly working to make sure the glass is full. But despite this, less than half of people come forward for help. And I wonder if some of this is because they're afraid they might become addicted to medication. But there is help available. There is hope and people do recover. There is so much that we can do for ourselves to help our own anxieties. We can have anxiety management techniques like mindfulness. It might help prevent that crisis. Psychological therapies like cognitive behavioral therapies help us to change the way we think about the and react to stresses and strains. For more severe symptoms, antidepressants may be offered. And it's worth noting that antidepressants are not addictive and they would be first line treatment for an anxiety disorder. Benzodiazepines are reserved for short term treatment for anxiety or insomnia that is severe, disabling or causing the person unacceptable distress. We use it at the lowest possible dose. Now there are some people who require long-term treatment with appropriate monitoring. Perhaps their symptoms were more severe or the antidepressants just didn't suit them. Now, unfortunately for me, the story and the cultural and social history of benzodiazepines hasn't been written in the Irish context yet. But at the time of Milltown, Ireland had the highest number of people per head of population in the psychiatric hospital, in an asylum. And that had actually very little to do with mental illness. So I can't see how any open expression of psychological distress would have been normal or would have been, you would have been able to do that in those days. Perhaps our age of consumerism came a little later. And we do have our love affair with alcohol. It seems to be our elixir of choice to dispel the gloom and make painful situations tolerable. So what about the Irish mammy? <laughs> well, apparently the Irish mammy is the dominant person in the family. They tend to make all of the significant decisions while giving the appearance that the father is the authority and the head of the house. It's a different stereotype anyway to the American housewife. So what are the concerns around benzodiazepine use in Ireland that the panel will debate later? Well, we're concerned about abuse of the medication. There is a growing illicit or illegal drug market in benzodiazepines in Ireland. And the drug treatment services are seeing an increase in the number of people presenting with problem benzodiazepine use. And it does complicate the management of other substance misuse like opiates. In a recent Dáil debate, Roisin Shortall said, that we have a very serious problem in Ireland with substance misuse. She said that our number one problem is alcohol and that the number two problem was the misuse of prescription drugs, in particular benzodiazepines. We're also concerned with overuse and inappropriate use of the medication. Has it become normal in Ireland to take benzodiazepines to dispel the misery of economic costs and social inequality. 
Interestingly, in Northern Ireland, they have a 212% higher rate of benzodiazepine use than in the rest of the United Kingdom. It became normal during the Troubles to take a benzodiazepine. Whole families took them. There have been reports of benzodiazepines being passed around at funerals, like cups of tea. And what about long-term use? What effects do they have on continued use? And should we be concerned about the, fe the effects that the medication have on our elderly population? The panel will discuss this later. So growing concerns in the 90s led to the the um, benzodiazepine committee being formed. And what they found was that approximately one in 10 people who have medical cards in Ireland were prescribed a benzodiazepine when they reported back in 2002. And they concluded that there is a problem in Ireland with benzodiazepine misuse. So they made several recommendations, and they recommended a multifaceted approach to this problem. They recommended better collection of data and monitoring of prescribing trends, better education for professionals about the good prescribing practice guidelines, better communication between health service providers, and legislative changes to improve control over the medications. A national survey, a household survey, found that 14% of Irish people had used a benzodiazepine in their lifetime, and 7% of people had used one within the last year. The people most likely to use a benzodiazepine were older adults, they were state dependent, or they had professional or higher managerial roles, or they were female, the Women's Health Council in Ireland point out that women are twice as likely to be prescribed a benzodiazepine for what they call non-clinical symptoms, such as stress, grief, <coughs> physical illness, or adjustment to a major life change. And should we, we be concerned about the use of benzodiazepines in terms of traffic accidents? And the Road Safety Authority recently launched a national campaign about reducing accidents due to drug use. Now, whenever the pharmacist dispenses a tranquilizer or a benzodiazepine, they'll put on it, warning, may cause drowsiness. If affected, do not drive or operate machinery. Now, this may seem rather obvious on a sleeping tablet, but we need to be aware of how these medications affect us. And the sleeping tablet may have effects the next day, or the benzodiazepine, when you start taking them, may cause sedation or impair your coordination. But on continued use, these effects do wear off. So prescribed use of anti-anxiety medication in consultation with your doctor usually allow you to go about your daily tasks as normal. And we need to be very aware of the interaction with alcohol, because when you add alcohol and a benzodiazepine, the effects are multiplied. And there are still sensationalized headlines in the newspapers about benzodiazepines. For the 50th anniversary of Valium, the Daily Mail described it as a drug that steals women's lives, that was more addictive than heroin, with horrifying side effects. So we've discussed the benzodiazepines, how they work, what they are. We've seen why there is a need to have effective treatments for anxiety disorders. We know that the medication has side effects that on continued use, if you stop it suddenly, you can get withdrawal symptoms, and some people abuse the medication. We know that there are concerns about their use in Ireland. And we know that there are alternatives available for the management of anxiety. 
from history, we see the need for safe medications to treat anxiety. We also see the need for access to the relatively more expensive psychological therapies. We see that normal cultural use fuels the use of benzodiazepines. And we see the impact of media and advertising on our perception of both the risks and benefits of the medication. And we see the importance of self-advocacy and proper information for patients so that they can be collaborative partners and make informed decisions about their own health care. Benzodiazepines remain important and useful medications. But the prescribing of benzodiazepines is a complex cultural and social process with political, economic, and moral implications. How can we build a society with the skills and the resilience to manage our fears and worries where anyone, mommy or otherwise, who needs a little help gets the right support at a time that's right for them. We all have a role to play. So I suppose the question is, what are we going to do to change the record? Thank you. So really what I wanted people to come away with was some practical information about the benzodiazepines, to know what their benefits are and what the risks associated with their use are. And I guess I told that within the story, within the history of the benzodiazepines, because it has a unique place in our culture and in our history. I thought it was a really interesting lecture. Um, probably the whole historical thing about the development of benzodiazepines was really, really interesting. Never knew that. All the kind of famous people who were addicted to tranquilizers over the last few decades was, was actually really, really interesting. Like there was an awful lot of work gone into it and yeah, it was presented really well. Yeah, it was great actually. Um, it was really informative. Um, and I'm not from a medical background myself, but it was really clear, um, really good interaction and um, just really interesting. Really enjoyed it.